Where did Usopp get that nuke from and how come he hasn't used it till now? I'm very glad you mentioned that because he has used it before. It was just an extremely long time ago. It was during Fishman Island when he and Chopper reformed the Alabaster Dream Team to fight against Daruma and Dosun. And it is such an epic looking attack. I think the word epic is incredibly overused, but this warrants it because this is Usopp dropping a plant nuke. And I have no idea why he doesn't use this more often. Or for that matter, most of the moves that he whipped out on Fishman Islands like the Impact Impact Wolf make that wolf was so cool, or any of the other amazing situational technical pop greens. Because Usopp has an answer to every question. But after Fishman Island, Oda just hasn't posed Usopp a lot of questions to answer. Apart from beating Sugar on Dressrosa, which really was more comedy focused. Apart from that, I still think that Usopp has yet to shine brighter than he did on Fishman Island. Punk Hazard was fairly uneventful for him. He took a bit of a vacation during Whole Cake Island. He got the least love of any straw hat by far on Wano. And Egghead didn't really give him anything to work with either. So hopefully, hopefully Elbaf is this opportunity. One Piece fans, finally Usopp gets stronger in this arc. Meanwhile, Oda, but I like Nami more. Honestly, I'll take either one. I think that Nami has been quite neglected as well. And also Chopper, Chopper. So here is my Elbaf proposal. We're on the island of strong battle strength. So wouldn't it be cool if this arc focused mostly on the weakling trio? On this island of raw power, what we get to highlight were Nami, Usopp, and Chopper, and how their own personal strength can compete with and complement the raw strength possessed by the Luffy's, the Zoro's, and the Sanjai's of the world. Sort of like what happened in One Piece Stampede. Before I said that Usopp hasn't really shined particularly brightly since Fishman Island, but there is an exception. It's this movie, Stampede was his movie. The premise was gathering all of the most powerful people in the world to fight against Douglas Bullet, and the person most responsible for ultimately defeating Bullet was Usopp. By far the physically weakest person of the island caused the downfall of the strongest, and that is the sort of stuff I love. It's not about Usopp receiving some sort of powerful god hammer and owning falls left, right, center, up and down, forwards, backwards, and always twirling, Way. twirling Way. towards Freedom. freedom. That's not who Usopp, Nami, or Chopper are. And this also takes me back to any slobby where Sanji saved Usopp from Jabra and his words were, I'll do what you can't and you do what I can't. What we need to explore is that can't, that can actually, what Usopp can do, and to try and extract it, to bring that out in its most potent form, to give him that almost gear fifth level of sniper freedom. I think we should start making theories based on height. The last one aged very horribly. All right, it's a good thing I've got my affairs in order because I am now going to proceed to die on this hill. The height and scaling in general so far has been ridiculous. For example, take this lovely shot of Iskat knocking Nami and Usopp out of Big Stein Castle. I love this panel because Oda so rarely uses that abundance of negative space these days, but that is not the point. The point is that Iskat fits in this castle quite comfortably. Meanwhile, we have this chapter and Iskat is pretty much the exact same size as the entirety of Big Stein Castle itself. And don't you even try to tell me that this is perspective. It's not. It's quite a small world. The castle is right there. It's not far off into the distance. And before this chapter, that cat fit in those rooms very comfortably. Just look at all the headroom that Iscat has here. Ah, oh, what luxury. And it's the same thing for Road and the Straw Hats. The sizing is very inconsistent. Like Road's workshop, we see this area and there's a door into the diorama that he would barely fit into. He definitely need to duck at the very least. And look, there's a bit more headroom in the diorama itself, but not much, right? because we can see the roof. But then we cut to some panels within the diorama where this room is like three times Rhodes' height. So look, in conclusion, the commenter is correct. We must immediately stop using height and size in general as any sort of metric for anything. At least for the duration of Elbaf, because Oda prioritizes art over logistics, as he should, quite frankly. Although I have to say that while the art errors have gotten better, they are still present, like this panel where Usopp is missing his beard and his mustache. It's not a huge deal, in fact, it took my thumbnail artist to point this out to me, but the frequency in which these small errors are happening are on a scale previously unseen in One Piece. And speaking of my thumbnail artist, I have a message for her husband, Hugh. You know who you are, Hugh. I've been told to tell you to pick up some Ben and Jerry chocolate fudge brownie ice cream on the way home. And the reason why I've been told to tell you this is because your wife says that you listen to my videos more than her voice, which honestly, I appreciate. The panel with the villagers talking about escaping really stood out to me. I'm so curious what their story is. Another brilliant comment by an even more brilliant channel member. 
See that shiny gold thing? That indicates a person of great intellect and undoubtedly pleasant aesthetic qualities. And you too could be one of these by becoming a channel member. But back to these villager dudes. I skipped over this in the review because I was so focused on Road being a little weirdo. But the other inhabitants of Legoland are very much confirmed to be there against their will. They are being forced to act in this RPG, which in this case does not stand for role-playing game. No, 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 this is a road-playing game. I, uh, I stole that from one of my commenters. You know who you are. No one else does, but you and I I know. But this makes things so much worse. It reminds me of Buggy forcing the Orange Town villagers to be his permanent audience in live action One Piece, or if you're a Hunter Hunter fan, then the idea of how Greed Island works, where the convicted felons were forced to be game NPCs, and they did exactly as they were told, otherwise Razor would blow their heads off. It's all quite twisted, and I guess their story is that Rhodes' bird friend has been scooping up pirates sailing around Elbaf and forcing them to be part of his fantasy world, where Rhodes gets to be in control for the first and possibly only time in his life because he's probably a loser in real life fictional pirate world. But here's something that might be a bit controversial. Oda could be using Road to make fun of himself because we have the maniacal storyteller building his extensive story world and Oda has been known to be quite emotive in the studio. His assistants often catch him cackling to himself if he's drawing something funny, for example. And also Oda does have something of a Nami obsession. I'll never not bring this up, but he married the actress who played Nami at the Jump Fest live show, so Look, what we could be seeing in Road is a lot of Oda himself. Harudin felt pretty superior to Luffy too before he got one shot by him, so that's a very good point. After reading this chapter, I went back to Harudin's bits on Dressrosa, and he actually displays some very road-like qualities, minus the human fetish. Harudin's reason for participating in the Corridor Coliseum was to acquire the Merimeronomi and become the quote, king of the giants, which is, uh, it's really interesting. It makes me wonder if he was planning on overthrowing Loki in the Elbaf monarchy. There's definitely a sense of generational dissatisfaction here, because Harudin, much like Road is here was extremely arrogant and shocked that anyone would dare challenge him, big giant man, all before he got put in his place by Luffy, Harudin's place in this case being on the floor. However, that wasn't the moment of change. That moment came when Harudin was turned into a toy, an adorable little elephant, and with all of his size, his strength, and other raw measurements of superiority stripped of him, Harudin had to rely on the weaker straw hat to save him. And that's what changed Harudin's views on strength. Whereas Road still has yet to have that kind of experience, because this really is a tale of youth. Young adults come out of high school and university with what they feel are very solid and unshakable beliefs in whatever they've been raised in, be it politics, religion, other social issues, and whatever. Doesn't matter what it is, what matters is that it's usually seen in terms of black and white. There is a correct answer and there is an incorrect answer. And then as you get older, as I continue to do, things get less clear, the world becomes more complicated, and you've got to seek deeper answers. And you've got to confront the fact that things are painfully nuanced. Road right now, he's at the beginning of that journey, he's a very young giant man. And so to him, giant superiority is the clear answer, just as it once was to Haridin. But maturity is knowing that things aren't that simple, which we see in all of our older gents, Dory, Rocky, Oimo, and Kashi, they've all had these experiences already, which is why each and every one of them showed so much respect to Usopp, because looks are very deceiving and you can't make these black and white judgments. I'll be honest, I'm not really sure what the reason for the map was. The crew already knew to just basically run in the other direction and they would hit another wall to bust through. So if, as I'm hoping, they leave the Lego world in the next chapter, it does bring up the question of why bother to find the map in the first place. But I think the answer to that is it's an easy excuse for exposition. Because in this sort of situation, Oda wants to explain the environment and I personally also want him to explain the environment. And there's only a couple of ways you can do that when Road himself isn't likely to provide it. So what we're doing here, it's sort of like watching Breaking the Magician's Code or something. They show you the illusion, and then they show you the engineering of how it was accomplished. That's what's happening here. We woke up in a magical, impossible wonderland, and now we're deconstructing that illusion, showing you all of the engineering behind it, possibly to make this world feel as small as possible before breaking into Elbaf properly and experiencing the true magic of the real island. And I quite liked reducing this whole realm to what is essentially some edgy kid's bedroom. That's the impression I got from the bird's eye view of the map anyway, because I used to build little Lego cities and stuff like that in my room when I was a kid. And were it socially acceptable, I'd do it again. Road ain't deranged, he's a Warhammer fan. Look, as a Warhammer fan, let me tell you this. Claiming to be a Warhammer fan is not an effective defense against anything and will generally only incriminate you further. I don't think they actually went through any sleeping mist. I think they were knocked from absinthe, but Road wouldn't have any way of knowing that. Maybe, I don't know, I don't know if it matters. It's all a bit too convoluted. 
Odors introduced the drunkenness, the hallucinations, and now the sleeping mist. So look, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think any of this was particularly planned out. We've explored Odors' tendency to improvise in a lot of other videos, but what we tend to do is highlight the moments of pure genius rather than the moments of not that. And this, I think, is one of those moments. He knew where he was and he knew where he wanted to go, but this feels like a series of last minute thoughts to fill in those gaps, which is why the explanation keeps changing. Again, I could be wrong, perhaps the mist and the absinthe going to come back as a very important plot point. But at the moment, I think they're the result of the best Oda could come up with on short notice. I mean, I don't know, here's one attempt to explain it. Maybe it was both the absinthe and the mist. It was a combination of the two that caused this. Because maybe the sleeping mist hangs so low that it doesn't affect the big, mighty giant ships. So everyone aboard the giant warrior pirate's vessel wasn't affected. They were affected by the alcohol, but not the mist. But everyone aboard the Thousand Sunny was affected by both the mist and the alcohol. So half the crew got completely smashed and half the crew got drugged by the mist, and that's how both of these devices play into where we are now. Which would be a kind of cool feature, I guess. The fact that Warland has this protective sleeping mist making Elbaf that much harder to invade, at least from a specific angle. Because to the best of our knowledge, Eustace Kid did not encounter the mist. So the mist may only exist in the direction facing Eckhead Island and not Wano. Luffy didn't turn old after Gear 5 this time. No, no, he didn't. He quite successfully activated Gear 5th and then switched back to normal. I think that may be because he only used it for such a short amount of time. On the other occasions where we've seen him become a shriveled prune on Wano and Egghead, this was because he ran out of stamina, or whatever it is that Gear Fifth drains from him. Haki, willpower, come. I don't, <laughs> I, say come. I don't think it's like old school Gear Third where it makes Luffy tiny no matter what. If he doesn't push himself too hard, I think that Luffy has the freedom to flick this on and off. Personally, I think Shinobu might just be trying to make herself look fat to avoid having anyone try to kidnap her. I don't know, I don't think that works though because Shinobu has the Alveda effect going on. She believes that she is just as if not much more attractive in the Sanja form. And anyone who disagrees gets thwacked in the sack. So if she was trying to avoid being captured, then maybe staying thin is the way to go, from her perspective anyway. Did you see the cover for chapter 898 and the title of the chapter? Do you think this was intentional by Oda or just coincidental storytelling? I did see it and I think it's the second one. Road was first shown to us on the cover of chapter 898 as stated, and the chapter title was I Will Return, which takes place just after Luffy beats Katakuri and he and Sanji return to the Thousand Sunny. Now, some people are trying to say that Oda purposely used Road on this cover as some sort of huge foreshadowing that he'll be back, but I don't think so. The thing about One Piece is that no matter which character appeared on this cover page with this title, you could make an argument for it being foreshadowing. So since it was during the Grand Fleet cover story, specifically the giant part. Let's say it was Gerd, Goldberg, or Stanson on this cover. It doesn't matter which one it is, people would have brought up this exact thing when we saw Gerd and Goldberg during the Egghead arc. They would have gone, oh, foreshadowing Gerd on the chapter. I'll be back, Oda. Mm. Ah, genius. So I think this is one of the moments where the fan base is just digging a bit too deep. Everything so far is happening too fast. I believe that if we truly have started Elbaf, then Oda has cut his ideas to the bare minimum. See, that's an interesting comment because I've also seen the exact opposite. That everything's happening too slowly in the last chapters that felt like a complete waste of time. What's going on, Oda, bruh? And I can see both perspectives because we did really blast through this initial Elbaf stuff. Oda set up and solved a mystery within the space of a single chapter. And again, I go back to Wano with stuff like this. Act one felt both really slow and really fast because we were blasting through stuff at quite the rapid pace, but said stuff was events like Luffy versus Orishima. So it felt like not a lot of deep progress was being made but it is, we're building ourselves up. We don't just rock up to the island and sock the main antagonist in the nuts out of nowhere. We take our time to work up the hierarchy a bit and discover what some of the intrinsic issues of the island are, like this giant superiority business. I suppose in this case, the intrinsic issue is that Elbaf clearly doesn't have enough focus on mental health programs because our road has been left behind and gone down quite a dark path. But also in regards to the feeling that we're moving quite slowly or quite quickly, I think the part of this is because we were just spoiled by Ekadai Island. Going back to the early Egghead chapters, Oda wasn't messing around. It genuinely went like this. Chapter 1, Jewelry Bonnie. Chapter 2, Vegapunk. Chapter 3, Rob Lucci. And Chapter 4, Blackbeard vs. Law. See what I mean? There are bombshells just dropped in every single chapter right from the get-go. But you compare that to Elbaf and it's like Chapter 1, Cat. 
Chapter 2, Dear Skull, and Chapter 3, Big Ol' Pervert. Egghead Island really grabbed us by the balls and refused to let go for two whole years. And because it's now been six years since the beginning of Wano, I feel like a lot of us have forgotten what the standard beginning of a One Piece arc feels like. Dad, it feels like this. And I get that that can come off as a little bit slow reading weekly, but I'm personally really glad that we are over 1,100 chapters into One Piece and Oda still feels comfortable taking little side trips like this. For the phenomenal experience that Egghead Island was, it really did feel like One Piece was ending imminently, and just thinking about my selfish perspective, that's not a thing that I look forward to happening. So I'm more than happy to go down as many dark story alleys as narrative drug dealer Etra Oda wants to usher me down.